Okay, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Stuart Singleton White. I'm head of campaigns at the Angling Trust. Um, before we start this evening's uh, uh, Sea Angling Forum, um, I'm sure you will all have heard the uh, sad news that the Queen passed away this afternoon. Uh, we have decided that we would go ahead um, with this forum. We didn't feel it was disrespectful to not go ahead or to go ahead with it, so we've decided to. But we felt it would be appropriate as a mark of respect to Her Majesty um, to have a minute's silence before we begin. So I hope you'll all join with me in just taking a moment um, to show uh, respect for Her Majesty um, and best wishes to the rest of the family uh, at this very sad time. Uh, and then we'll start the forum after that. OK, so thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, so welcome to this, the eighth annual uh, or the eighth virtual sea angling forum of 2022. Um, on this occasion, uh, we're very well delighted to have the National Mullet Club back with us. Um, we had a really interesting evening back in July. Um, and this evening we're going to focus in on um, fishing for mullet with the on the fly. Um, so I have with me Andy Burt, uh, Paul Jennings and Colin McLeod from the National Mullet Club. Um, um, and um, in a moment, I'm going to hand over to them. But before I do, uh, just a little bit of housekeeping and a little bit of information on how the evening's going to run. So the first thing is we are recording this session. We do that um, because we post this on the website shortly after the uh, forum has taken place um, and we actually do find that we get uh, quite a number of views to these uh, virtual sea angling forums on our website um, so they're a pretty popular thing and we pick up a, a much larger audience um, you know as as time goes on so um, this is a, a good moment not only for this evening but you know we're saving it for posterity I suppose you could say um, working hard with me tonight in the background is Nevin Hunter, our Marine Coordinator, uh, and Hannah Rudd, our Campaigns Manager. Um, Nevin is doing all the technical background, so he'll be letting you in, he'll be helping to run the PowerPoints, he'll be dealing with any issues. Hannah will be monitoring and moderating the questions. Um, so let me just explain briefly how the question session is going to work. Um, we're going to have some PowerPoint presentations, particularly from Colin. Um, during that, if you think of any questions or have any questions, I would request that you put them in the chat box. There should be a little icon at the top of your screen with chat written on it. If you click on that icon, it'll open up a, a chat box and you can type your questions in there. And those are the questions that Hannah will moderate. Um, if we have time after we've dealt with all the questions put into the chat box, we will um, we will open the floor to any other questions. Now that will be dealt with by asking you to raise your hand. You can do that if you've not used Teams before by uh, again going to the top of your screen. Uh, there should be a button called reactions with a little smiley face and a big hand. If you click on that, you'll see a hand icon come up underneath it and you just press that and you'll raise your hand and we'll be able to spot you. Um, if we do come to you for a question, just give us a moment to open your camera and open your mic um, and then you'll be able to ask your questions directly of Colin, Paul or Andy. Um, so I think that's probably enough in terms of the 
um, introduction. You're not really here to listen to me this evening. You're listen. You're here to listen to Colin, uh, uh, Colin, uh, Andy, and um, Paul. So um, I will shut up and I will hand over, I think, to Andy, who's going to do a quick introduction to the National Monarch Club before we hear from Colin. Andy. Hi. Hi everyone and uh, welcome to the evening. Yes, good to see you again, especially in these circumstances. Um, I'm going to give you a quick introduction to the club, who we are and what we do. And then I'll hand you over to Colin for his presentation. And then subsequently Paul and Colin will answer any of your questions. If there's anything general you want to ask about the club, then I'll come back and uh, hopefully answer the questions for you. OK, great. Let's get started then. So if we can move on next slide, please. So who are the NMC? Well, we've been around for a long time. We've been around since 1975. I haven't been a member that long. I've been a member for about eight years. And the club was brought about basically to fish for grey mullet, learn more about the fishing for grey mullet and promote the um, sustainability. Um, next slide, please. Next slide, please, Nevin. Right, great. Um, so the aims of the NMC, I'm not going to read them all out uh, in today's world. The top one to promote the interest of those willing to fish for them recreationally and the bottom one. We're getting a lot of um, commercial fishing going on in recreational areas, and nursery areas and it's hammering and great hammering bass, gilthead bream, flounders and all the other fish that use these inshore areas as nursery areas. So that's the most imp two important things at uh, the aims of the club. Uh, next slide, please, Nevin. So we're not 100% catch and release. If somebody wants to take a fish to eat, um, then it's frowned upon by some. Others, they take an odd one. It's not really going to harm the stock. The stock's being harmed by many other factors. Um, but one of them, as you can see from the, the chart, the decline in grey mullet in the last 10 years has been phenomenal. So we've really got to look at how we can change that and work to change that. And if you can move to the next slide, please. So why are they in decline? Well, they're very, very extremely vulnerable, long lived. They live in shore. There's no real fishery management for them and commercial fishing is increasing as other stocks. There's more and more pressure put on some mullet. Uh, it's important that we, we work hard and, and, and try and uh, get them protection until they're adults and get them fished sustainably. Uh, next slide, please. There's a quick graph there that just shows exactly how long they have lived they are and if you think that to get to about 400 or so centimeters uh, they're into the sort of three pound four pound bracket not massive but nice to catch they're, they're going to be anything up to between 15 and 20 years old so they've had to survive in shore for 15 to 20 years extremely long uh, uh, next slide please The fishing for grey mullet. Um, why fish for them? It's a challenge, great fun, lovely places, brilliant variety of venues. It's a real challenge. One of the great things about them is who can fish them? Well, everyone. As you can see tonight, we've got mostly game fishermen being transitioned from freshwater to fish you can catch. The coarse angling background, many of the coarse angling background, or as a sea angler wanting another challenge. They're great as a lure angler. There's something there for every for every fisherman and mullet. So they're, they're a great species. So what do we do? Um, we we hold a, quite a few get-togethers through the year. Um, you can see a picture there of our recent masterclass, and on the far, far left is uh, Paul Jennings, who's kindly helped us to, tonight. Um, so we try and introduce and help people to catch mullets and, and grow interest in the species. Uh, next page, please. So 
Sorry, next slide, please, Evan. Getting a slight delay, Andy. Yeah, yeah, OK, no problem. So, OK, so I hope I've kept that fairly quick. Uh, we can make the presentation available for you. There's a bit of information on it if you want to go through it, and you can always contact us and ask other questions. So, I'd like to say thanks very much for listening. Really hope you enjoy the evening and find it valuable. I'm, I'm sure we all will. And now I'd like to uh, briefly hand you back to um, Nevin and uh, on to Colin for the main presentation. Thank you very much, guys. Thanks for that, Andy. Um, and I went to the masterclass and um, and thoroughly enjoyed myself. I got knee high uh, in mud, which was quite fun and I didn't catch anything, but I learned a huge amount and I can't wait to go again. Um, but what I particularly want to do as a, as a fly fisherman is learn from Colin uh, and brush up on my skills. So without further ado, let me hand over to Colin. Thanks. Thanks very much. And thanks everyone for uh, taking the trouble to join us on a very sad evening. Um, however, it is, it is very pleasing to me to, to witness the growth and popularity in fly particularly developed in, in recent years. Uh, and I think that's demonstrated by the um, Mullet and Fly Facebook group, which now has 9,000 members, which is what was until recently considered to be a, a niche fish. Uh, next slide. Yeah, I've, I've been fly fishing for Mullet now for 14 years. And during that period, I've been able to share my exploits with the readers of Fly Fishing and Fly Time magazine um, in an attempt to encourage people to pick up the mullet challenge because it was quite lonely when I first started out. So it's, it's, it's a great reason now to have some company to have a shoulder to cry on when necessary. <laughs> Um, and during the, the first lockdown in uh, May 2020, I took the opportunity to write a book uh, called Funny, quite imaginative. But um, that's 303 pages uh, packed with all the information you need to catch your first mullet and subsequent after that. So it's, it's a worthwhile investment. It's one of those clients should really start learning. Um, I don't guide for mullet anymore, I have in the past, but mullet guides out there so a, a, a main reason for the book really was to remotely guide people to towards a, the first mullet. Um, when I first started to fly fish the mullet uh, was 14 years ago the general advice back then was don't waste your time to fly but things have moved on significantly since then and with the availability of effective flies and techniques um, I think it's fair to say that we've put a fair old dent in the mullet code, if not quite cracking it yet. Um, you, you might wonder what uh, what type of anglers would become interested in fly fishing for mullet. In my experience, it, it, they fall into two ca categories. Uh, firstly, sea anglers who have decided to take up a new challenge by picking up a um, and freshwater anglers, anglers from a freshwater background, uh, are looking for a change. Um, the sea anglers probably have a bit of a, an advantage in terms of knowledge of the tides and marks and how, how the, the whole sea thing works. And that they, they know how to cast a fly line, they understand the equipment involved in fly fishing. And what I've found is that they tend to buddy up. And when I f first became interested in saltwater fly fishing back about 2005, it was quite common to see sea anglers and fly fishers joining together and they, they share their, their combined knowledge to help each other along the path. Of course, the, the main core is the bass, because uh, they're slightly more approachable, I'd say, than the lip. But, um, as time's gone by, it's really pleasant to, pleasing to see that the mullet are becoming more and more. Um, next slide. The importance of feeding fish. I've, I've chosen that as the first slide because that's probably the most crucial aspect of success 
the five foot ten commodity. It'll become apparent as, as this presentation goes on, but it really is incredibly important. If, if you can't find feeding fish, then everything, all, all your, your work up to that point is. Only feeding fish for, for competitive feeding as well, which is a situation where you have a, a, a density of fish. In the photograph, you can probably see 10 fish there. They're quite closely grouped, so it's a good density. And these fish are actually feeding, they were feeding at the time when the photograph was. was and th their density is good enough to introduce competitive feeding, which means that if you introduce a fly amongst those fish, their feeding behavior is going to be so heightened that it's really a case of first come, first serve to, to take. So it's really tilting the, the odds in the angler's favour. If you had the same 10 fish, but they were spread out 20 feet apart, moving quite slowly, then your chances are extremely low. If you learn one thing from tonight, please let it be that you need to find feeding fish. Um, Locations. Um, newcomers to saltwater fly fishing so from, from a, a fly fishing background can find the ocean extremely daunting to say the least. Um, in the background of that photograph, you can see the Isle of Wight, so at least it has a, a horizon. In some instances, all you see is the open sea with no parameters. Um, that can be quite, quite daunting, as I say. So, Break it down into small segments, and these segments are called marks. And marks are simply locations where uh, there are features that persuade fish to to hang around, to feed, pick up some kind of residency. So, locations are are, are the places to, to start. Estuaries are, are by far and away the most productive mullocks, and that's where the, the great majority of mullet are, are caught and fly. Um, I, I realise that fish are dotted all around the country, some right in the country. We're going to have a fair distance to travel to find them. Uh, my, my advice would be to, find, to choose them close to home as possible. The obvious reason for that is that it gives you the maximum opportunity and explore it and, and find out what it's all about. Um, and the estuaries really are the, the best places to choose if possible. They're extremely food rich and bio, biodiverse uh, locations. Uh, they offer shelter for mullets. So, In, in these locations. Uh, so if uh, you can at all choose an estuary as the location to, to explore. Thanks. They, they can also provide the river shown in the photograph there is uh, in East Sussex. There's a chap called Sam Waldman there prospecting trying to catch his first mullet. Um, in that photo, we were looking for thin lips because it was probably about three miles upstream. Uh, and that shows just how far they are likely to, to travel upstream. Uh, that, later on in that particular day, we ended up six miles upstream catching thin lips as well. Um, the thin lips will, at, at that stage, the, the rivers this is still tidal, as I say, and they tend to be quite deep, deep enough that the, the thin lip can remain upstream. Uh, throughout the whole summer, and uh, there's you know plentiful food available for them. Um, it's quite a pleasant day to wander a river like that one, just wandering the banks in the sunshine, looking for evidence of mullet feeding in the margins or on the surface. And what we noticed quite quickly was that the shoals tend to be located on bends in the river, and that's a, a good example of a bend in the river there. So if you're going to go looking for them, then concentrate your efforts on, on the bends in particular. Thick, thick lip mullet, they will come into tidal rivers, but only travel perhaps a mile upstream. 
Um, South Wales has some superb examples of tidal rivers with thicklet mullet. Uh, and the, the, the thicklets will travel upstream to the point that they're actually entering the freshwater pools where you expect to find trout. So that, that's how far, far they will be. Um, and they're, they're looking for shrimp, as are the thinlets in the, in the East Sussex River. So shrimp are the, the main items on the menu. And you can get some really large thicks of the, the largest I've caught in a tidal river is eight pound twelve on fly, so you can expect some some decent fish. Golden greys aren't so, so keen on travelling up river for this reason, but you will find the, the mouth of estrix. Next slide, please. Lagoons. Lagoons are effectively small estuaries. That particular lagoon that is in Spain. I chose a photograph because it's a pretty photograph, basically. But you'll get the same uh, idea in, in the UK as well. And lagoons basically fill up on the flooding tide. And then as the tide ebbs, uh, the, the water runs through the lagoon and out through the narrow entrance. And it creates a current which is uh, similar to the current that you find in an estuary. And that these currents are very attractive to all manner of fish, not just mullet species, but predatory fish as well. Uh, so, so they're, they're excellent locations for sport in general. But, uh, again, they'll, they'll produce some some very large mullet as well. Next slide, please. The open coast. That's certainly a section of open coast that you're looking there. It's about three miles long. Uh, it's in South Wales again. It's a neap tide, so quite a weak tide, but the, the water is actually a mile distant. You can just see it. And the horizon's a bit below walking 28 degrees of heat. Um, but that, that's wonderful golden grey locations. And you'll, you'll find similar beaches in the southwest, Devon, and, and of course, South Wales. Um, so that's a place really to be looking for, for golden greys, especially if you have a river running into a beach somewhere to that. The prime example might be Hale Estuary uh, in, in the North Cornish coast. Uh, where if you walk to the, the where the river meets the sea at low tide, um, you will find that golden greys congregate around the river mouth and uh, along the adjoining beach. I've seen shoals probably quarter of a mile long more. And then as soon as the tide starts to flow, uh, a number of these golden greys will enter the river and travel upstream on the flooding tide, while others just simply move in over the sand fields following the edge of the tide. Uh, so, so they give the potential for some fantastic fishing. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk about approaches uh, for that type of scenario as well. Um, another occurrence on open coast, which has provided probably some of the, the best mullet fishing I've ever enjoyed, uh, and again in South Wales, is that the occurrence of an algae called Phyocystis fargesii. And it's an algae that blooms uh, in the shallow water once the, the water starts to heat up in the early summer. Uh, once, once it blooms, it dies, and white algae then turns a, a sort of chocolatey brown frothy material, and it's deposited on the sand as the tide recedes. Um, and then when the tide comes in again, it starts to pick up this brown frothy material, it carries it in the water, and the, the mullet go absolutely crazy for this stuff because it contains polysaccharides, carbohydrates, and a lot of manner of nutritious elements. So you can have literally thousands and thousands of mullet feasting on this um, decaying algae. Uh, it doesn't make them any easier to catch, but uh, it's, it's definitely worth worth looking for. But next slide, please. Creeks. Well, if you want to give yourself the ultimate mullet and fly challenge, then creeks probably take the hooks. Um, the fish I have in the photograph, they looks called back in July. Uh, it was probably 10 years ago since I last caught the fish in similar circumstances. Uh, the, the pace of life in creeks is very slow. The availability of food tends to be less and you would find in estuaries, for instance. Uh, so consequently, there are less fish that come into these areas. Um, you, you will see them swimming slowly about or, in the case of that fish, just sitting stationary. I, I was passing the, the creek on the way to stretch open course and I thought I've, I've got to have a cast and it was one of those one cast in a thousand that the fish decided it was having the, 
attacked Romy Sandstrom and it absolutely smashed it. So uh, always worth having a cast if you're passing a coach, but um, they are definitely the toughest venues. Um, having said that, there's there's some anglers in uh, London who are fishing the Thames now. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it's best to choose the, the location that's closest to your home. Unfortunately for them, it's uh, it's a River Thames, which is not an easy option. But uh, guys like uh, Tim Tim James, they're, they're coming up with some new techniques for creeks, which involve the same type of flies as as, as we use in general for mullet, but they're, they're using an indicator method, so leaving the the, the fly, for instance, a flexible one stationary on the bottom, and just waiting for the mullet to pick the fly up. So that's an interesting development. It may make creeks just a, a bit easier. Uh, next slide, please. Equipment. Um, if we were standing in a lecture hall at this point, we would be showing you various pieces of equipment that are used on a day to day basis. So uh, I'll just have to describe them. So please use your imagination. Uh, the, the basic outfit for, for mullet is a six weight outfit with a floating line. It's always a floating line. The reason for that is you're mainly fishing from mullet in very shallow water, often with a bit of current if you're drifting the flies. So you want the fly line to pass over any mullet that are in shallow water. And by shallow, I mean four, four inches to 12 inches. That's your typical depth. You, you don't want a sinking line or an intermediate line that's going to actually run through the mullet because that, that, that's written. So always floating line. Uh, six weight outfits, ideal I would say, because it's strong enough to tame mullet. I've, I've had a flathead mullet in Spain to over 11 pounds on a six weight that controlled them no problem at all. Uh, bass and things of that nature to, to seven pounds, again, very easily controlled. So the six weight is strong enough. Uh, it's also light enough and delicate enough that if you're fishing for mullet in very shallow conditions, calm conditions, it's an obvious advantage to be using a light setup. You don't need to be putting an eight weight or nine weight line on them or near them and possibly spook them. Uh, the, the real, uh, I, would, I would say it's sensible to have about 100 metres of backing just in case you, you get that, that big one. Um, general clothing would be wading boots and waders. Uh, sometimes you have to travel vast areas of coastline to, to find the mullet feeding. So you want to be able to travel light, so some, some light waders, a backpack or a sling pack. Uh, try, try and keep everything down to a minimum. You don't want to be carrying any excess weight with you. Uh, a hat and a buff is a good idea because uh, the, the coast is often, often sunny. Uh, the reflection off the water can, can end up get, easily end up getting burnt. Uh, so uh, a buff is added uh, protection in that respect. Sunglasses will protect your eyes from the glare, and they'll also protect your eyes from, from hooks. Um, if, if you look on the uh, fly fishing forums and Facebook groups, you'll, you'll see the perennial question pop up every so often. Uh, what are the best sunglasses? Well, I would say the best sunglasses are the ones that you can afford. Um, cheaper ones will certainly work, polarized glasses, but um, the more expensive glasses, there's no doubt about it, they, they give you far better vision. Um, and you're often having to look through the water to, to discover the fish. And if the, your sun, sunglasses don't afford you the ability to do that, then you're going to be missing on fish and your, your catch rate's going to drop. So I, re I really would recommend the, the best quality sunglasses that you can afford. Um, there's a piece of equipment called a, a rig, a line rig. Uh, and fly fishing has borrowed it from the course fishing fraternity, I would say. Uh, and it is, it's just a piece of plastic about six inches long with some foam in it. And what it enables you to do is make up some, some leaders with flies attached uh, before you go fishing. And I usually carry two or three in my sling pack in case I get a tangle. Uh, and the, the, the reason for that is, is twofold. One, it can save you a lot of time. On a windy day, if you're standing there trying to tie up a new leader or attach one, it's, it's going to take a bit of time and it's extremely frustrating. And it becomes even more frustrating if you get that tangled just as a big shoulder mullet start to feed 10 feet away from you. You do not want to be standing there tying up a new leader when that sort of uh, feeding behaviour is going on. Not very good for your mental health. 
So prepare some some leaders on on the, on the rigs so you can have a quick changeover. If I have a tangle leader, I can change it over in less than one minute using the rig system. Uh, the, the leaders I use, I use a, a bonefish leader, which is a tapered four carbon leader. Uh, they come in packets nine feet long. I cut them down to about seven feet and put a surgeon's loop in the end. And then the, the rigs that I've just mentioned, I tie them about six feet of fluorocarbon, uh, 0.218 millimeter diameter. And again, I attach a loop to the end of the, the leader. So it's a loop to loop connection that you end up with. Um, and that, that saves you 50% of the fluorocarbon that you, you would use. Uh, the stuff I use is about 26 quid for a real. So, you know, that, that sort of cost you want to be saving if, if you possibly can. Um, tide tables, I, I would view them as equipment. Uh, what are the costs of the set I've got here for Portsmouth? It's about two quid, but they're, they're actually worth the weight in gold. Uh, the information they contain, um, some people may think they're old school because you can use the apps on your, on your phone. But the, the phone apps, yeah, they're great if you want to look at the tides from maybe next week. But if, if like me, you want to be uh, planning your, your next year's fishing in October when these tide tables become available, then uh, you know, they're, they're, they're a great piece of kit, definitely. Um, I can plan the whole next season uh, in October based on the information that's contained within the tide tables. Um, also, if, if you're trying to catch your first mullet, you've staked out the location and you've been successful uh, and, you, and you've found a productive location, when you, you're going to have to stake out that location through all the different tides uh, because in some areas, the fish may appear, for instance, on the flood for 15 minutes, and it's a 15 minute window. So if you only investigate your chosen mark on the on the app and then think, oh, this isn't working, I'm going somewhere else, then you're, you're going to miss that period of activity when it does occur on the flood. If you um, if, if you decide after the ebb's been fruitless to oh, I'll hang on for the flood for a little while, and then after two hours you think, no, nothing's happening, on me. and then 10 minutes later the fish arrive, Again, you've missed out. So you've got to stake that particular marker right through the air, not through the flood. And not just on one tide, because obviously different tides have different strengths. So you have to check them all out. So that's why I recommend that you choose a location close to home, because you really want to be on the water as much as possible to, to evaluate that particular mark. Maybe on the first few visits, don't take a flyer, you know, take, a, take a flask of coffee on a Mars bar and, and just sit and observe because you, you learn so much. But when you and the fish eventually do coincide, you need to make a note of that on your tide tables because they're, they're pretty, mullet are, they're creatures of habit where you have a large enough population. If you've got a few hundred fish, that's large enough to influence their behaviour that they will feed regularly in the same place at the, at the same time. Once you've noted that time and place, uh, two weeks later you'll have a similar tide. It's, it's a very high likelihood that the fish will be back at exactly the same time. And next time, yes, time, slide, please. Flies. Um, when I first started fly fishing from mullet, um, I, I, I visited a, a, a pretty well-known bass mark. And I was hoping to find some bass at the mouth of an estuary. Uh, what I found instead were hundreds of extremely large mullet in a small pool between some gravel bars. The, the only fly I had on was a white deceiver, a bass fly. I didn't have any mullet flies, so I just decided to have a go with that um, with that white deceiver. And for 45 minutes, I was thrashing the water, putting this fly in front of countless, extremely large mullet without any reaction. Then my phone rang and allowed the fly to drop to the gravel below in about a foot of water. And 30 seconds into the call, the, the rod was practically ripped out in hand. Um, and then a, a large mullet proceeded to, to jump in the air with the deceiver clearly visible in its mouth. Um, after a few minutes, it, it threw the hook. You know, that just left me shaking like a leaf. Uh, I couldn't hear for the, the sound of my heart and my ears. Uh, and from that moment on, I was just 
was sort of with mullet really. So I went home and uh, Googled, Googled mullet flies. Um, and I, apart from warnings, do not go any further, things of that nature. After about 20 pages, I found reference to, to somebody catching a mullet in a flexi worm. So, uh, or or a, an, an app's blood wound. It's, it's a trout version. Uh, so I had a few of them in my trout box. Went back the next morning and saw a shoal of mullet approaching up the current. And on the very first cast, I caught uh, a four pound fish on the, on the flexi worm. So that was it from that point in time. I really forgot about bass and the beloved trout in the north of Scotland, and I just became fixated on mullet. And that, that particular fly did, did me well for the first season. Um, practically every time I went to the, the estuary close to my home, I would at least have a fish on, uh, even if just for a few seconds, at least I had a reaction. So I was quite pleased. And I would maybe catch a fish every three sessions. And compared to um, the very rare catch reports that were, were put on the sea fishing forums at that time, um, that, that was a pretty good measure of success. So I was reasonably happy with that. Then in 2010, uh, a friend of mine, Joe Walker, gave me a fly called, uh, they called it raised mullet, back, raised mullet fly. And it was basically a dye back, which is a, traditional Welsh trout pattern, but they had added two red glass beads to the head. And um, Joe gave me one of those flies early June, and that was, that for me, the real breakthrough, because I went from early June through to late August, um, fishing several times a week because I was redundant uh, from a job in the construction industry at that point. Um, so I didn't blank from early June to late August. I mean, that, that was unheard of. Uh, so that, that was a real breakthrough. Um, and so now I had two flies uh, that I could put in the cast of worm in the point, mullet back on the, on the dropper, and yeah, it was, it was quite good. But there would occasionally rise situations where neither fly uh, would work. For, for instance, there was a heat wave one year, um, and the mullet were lying in relatively deep water in a very strong current. So the unweighted flies were just passing over, and, uh, and I knew I had to go home, sit at the vice, and Come up with, with an alternative. So I just used the flexi worm again, but added lead to the body and a gold bead to the head. Went back the next day um, and caught mullet and, and bass. Lost a big sea trout because that fly was getting down to the deck at which the, the fish were feeding. So, um, and it, through similar situations as, as the years went on, I've, I've now developed about 15 different patterns and they've mainly been in response to a situation where the existing patterns are in the box didn't quite work. So you have to come up with a solution. And that solution is in a fly. But we're, we're not going to talk about all 15 patterns tonight. Uh, so we'll look at the top six, uh, which really are the sort of flies that you would look to use on a day-to-day -day basis uh, to, to catch mullet during the summer. Uh, next slide, please. Um, that's the, the Romy Sandshrimp. Um, that is easily the most productive mullet fly that I've come up with. It's always on my leader. Uh, I, I normally tie it in the dropper, a very short dropper of about two inches, and that's to reduce the incidence of tangles when you're fishing in uh, coastal areas, which tend to be windy. So that, that tends to, that's a problem for newcomers, especially to saltwater fly fishing. They'll end up getting a lot of tangles. So to uh, preclude that, then keep your the droppers down to about two inches. It means you can't change the fly, of course, but I would never change that, that fly. It's always on my leader because it is so good. If you want to change the fly, then you can change the uh, point fly. Uh, as you can see, it's a light golden color colored fly, and it, it was uh, created to represent a, a light golden olive, olive covered shrimp that uh, Joe Walker and I used to find in our wading boots after wading through sand trying to catch golden grey mullet in the Hampshire mark. When we went back to the car park, and we, we could never catch these devils, when we went back to the car park and took our boots off, these little golden shrimp things were hopping about all over the place. So that's what that fly was intended to represent, but it works anyway. It works over sand, mud, and various species. So if, if I was going to uh, fish with just one fly, that's the fly. Next slide, please. Spectra shrimp, as you can see, it's quite a blingy fly. 
I saw that material in Fly Fish and Fly Time magazine and instantly thought that, that may work for mullet. But when I tied the first one, especially on a gold hook, then I thought, no, that's, that's going to scare the fish rather than attract them. So it sat in my box for a while uh, until I was in Spain uh, one holiday with my daughter Audrey. And we were struggling to catch any fish. And I opened the box and I said, right, Audrey, choose the fly. And she went straight for it, and probably because she could see their potential as a as a pair of earrings, that blingy. So I uh, put it on and it just hammered the predatory fish and uh, caught some mullet as well. Uh, and strangely enough, I returned to the UK, uh, didn't reach for that straight away in my next session, but it was back in the box again and, and until one day in the Welsh Tidal River, all the normal flies were being ignored. And then that was the last resort, stuck it on the first cast that caught an eight pound twenty thick, which um, is, is recognised as a UK record on a on fly route. Um, next slide. The mullet back, that's the fly that Joe Walker and the Welsh chap for Ray Bramble um, came up with. The, the original had some partridge feathers at the end and it was a much more bushy fly. So I've, I've tended to make the profile more slimline, added the red tag and, it, and it's you know, hopefully improved it even further. But it's, it's, it's a wonderful fly. Great for all three species. Uh, you can dead drift it to, to thick lips. And it's uh, yeah one, one of the top three patterns, I would, I would say. Next slide, please. The, the Ghostbuster, that, that's another pattern that was created in response to a problem. And that problem was um, at my normal mullet mark, thick lips were entering water, uh, in all honesty, two to three inches deep. So their backs were well out of the water and they were taking shrimp off, off gravel in this uh, very shallow current. And of course, you couldn't drift the flies because it was just too shallow, the current was too weak. So I thought a buoyant fly would solve the problem. Came up with that one and immediately it worked. But it, it's not just good in very shallow water, it's great running run about weed, bladder rack, for instance. If you've got fish feeding, feeding in bladder rack, then that fly can travel around the weed without getting trapped. And bass love it as well. So it, it's come up with some really nice fish. So well worth uh, having, having in the mullet arsenal. Uh, next slide, please. Flexiworm, that's uh, basically the first mullet fly I ever came up with. Uh, I've added a red glass bead to the head, the same as the, uh, the dye back had. Uh, there's absolutely no doubt that the colour red has a major attraction for mullet. Uh, why that should be, I honestly I can't say. Um, maybe in the case of the shrimp patterns at a tie, and I've added a red tag to them, it's possibly when fish approach a group of shrimp, you know, maybe two, two or three hundred shrimp, uh, who, who are all of a similar appearance. If you introduce your fly to that group of shrimp and it's got a red tag, it possibly makes it stand out amongst the crowd and gives the fish something to focus on. That's uh, the only sort of theory I can think. Uh, next shrimp. Uh, next slide, please. Mullet ID. It's always useful to know uh, exactly which species of mullet you've got, especially if you're new to the sport. Um, and there, there's some really simple checks, but confusion, unfortunately, is also simple. <coughs> Excuse me. I caught this fish uh, back in July, which I was convinced was a thick lip and saw the small shoal uh, move into a current defeat. But then as I walked the, the fish back towards Andy Ford, who was fishing with that day, for to take a photograph, I noticed the gold spot in the gill, and I thought, oh my good goodness, I've maybe broken the UK record here for a, the golden grey. But um, as you can perhaps see, the, the upper lip already looks quite thick in that photograph. Um, and, it, and it was actually a thick lip, but it just shows how confusion can easily enter the equation. Next slide, please. And th that's that same fish. And, you can see how pronounced the gold spot is, uh, but you can also see that uh, the upper lip is quite thick, as you would find in a thick lip. Next slide, please. Thick lips. Um, well, it's, it really does, as it, as it says says on the tin. The, uh, the upper lip is very thick, and it's covered in papillae. 
And that, that's a real distinguishing feature of picklets. Apart from their size, if, if you see a fish swimming around and it's uh, five or six pounds, it's almost certainly a picklet. Uh, the, the UK record uh, on any methods, uh, I think it's about 14 pounds, two ounces. So they, they do go to a large size, but that thick upper lip is the main identifying feature. And you can see a ghost cluster is uh, added to that lip there. Uh, next slide, please. Thin lip. Again, it does what it says on the tin. Very thin upper lip in comparison to the thick lip. Um, sometimes you will catch thick lips that have a smooth upper lip. It's still of a good size, but it's, it's smooth without the papillae. Uh, and again, that can lead to confusion. But if you look at the pectoral fin there at the base, there's a black circle. Every thin lip of have has a very pronounced black circle, black spot at the base of the pectoral, so that is your second identifying feature uh, for thin lips. Uh, the record is, I think it's about eight and a half pounds, roughly now, any method. Um, and uh, so size is an indicator again. If it's uh, sort of three pound up to four, chances are it's a, it's a thin. Next slide, please. Golden greys. Um, mullet have the wonderful nickname in Britain of the British bonefish, which is uh, an accolade indeed. Uh, and I, I would say of the three species, the, the golden grey probably looks most like a bonefish. And in a moment, we'll, we'll have a look at that bonefish and you can see the comparison. Uh, it's obviously got the gold thumbprint on the, on the gill plate there. It has a smooth upper lip and it has a very long pectoral fin. Uh, and, and that uh, is, t testifies the, uh, the fact that golden greys are related to, to flying fish because it has an extremely long pectoral. Uh, that, that fish weighed three pounds, which is a specimen of a golden grey, and it, it gave a wonderful, wonderful fight, great run. And as I say, of the three species, I would say they're most likely green fish. And the behaviour, they, they run hard. Uh, probably the most predatory of the three minute species as well. Catching a single mullet on its own, whether it's a thick lip or a thin lip or a, or a golden grey, is uh, no easy matter, but it's most likely to happen with a golden grey. Uh, the, the UK record is just over three pound eight ounces, and so they're, they're the smallest of the three meat species. Next slide, please. And there is a bonefish, um, which is, I say, there is a, a fair resemblance to the golden grey in particular. Bonefish, I, I was asked when I first started mullet fly fishing, uh, what's the fastest a mullet or a bonefish? And I thought, well, I don't really know, so I need to go bone fishing to, to find out. And yeah, the bone fish is quicker, there's no doubt about it. Uh, but the, the, the mullet fights uh, substantially harder. The bone fish is finished within about five minutes, uh, whereas a, a mullet will keep on doing it. Next slide, please. Techniques for catching mullet. Uh, the techniques vary slightly for each species and we'll have a look at uh, these now for each species. Next slide, please. Thick lips. Um, the most productive uh, location for thick lips, as mentioned, is, is an estuary. And in the estuary, you will tend to find thick lips feeding in, in the current where the river runs into the sea. Uh, they, they sit in that current because it's basically a conveyor belt carrying food to them. Uh, so they just sit there. It's a bit like one of these Japanese restaurants where you sit at a table and a conveyor passes with all the food on it. And that's, that's pretty much how it is for thick lips in a, in a current. And the, the most effective technique is called dead drifting. And it's, it's very, very straightforward indeed. You just take up position about 10 or 15 yards up current from the thick lips. It's easy to see for a shoal or feeding because they splash, they jump in the fins and tails of cut through the surface. So you stand up current 10, 10 yards and just drift the flies towards them. And it's a, a dead drift. And it really is a dead drift. Because if, if you think back to the, the time when um, I hooked with my first mullet and it was on a deceiver fly, of which the, the fish ignored for 45 minutes when it was moving through. But the second that it fell to the, to the bottom and, and lay there for 
for a period of time, a mullet decided to pick it up. And I think that's because mullet perhaps see it as one of their functions to mop up detritus, which includes dead organisms, whether it be shrimp, other invertebrates, or, or small fish. Um, so the, the fish that are sitting in this current are really looking for dead organisms. And that's a great way of conserving energy as well. So you must really completely dead drift the flies to these fish. If you move the flies in any way, it'll turn them off. I've seen the reaction. You know, it just doesn't fit in with their expected feeding form. So don't move the flies, just dead drift them. Uh, keep an eye on the end of the, the fly line for any movement. And if you suspect that there's any interest, then give a little strip strike. It only needs to be about six inches to a foot long um, to, just to set the hook. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and, and then be prepared for a uh, fight in life. Um, thin, thick lips will, of course, feed in static water as well, outside the, the current, uh, mainly on shrimp. So if, if you see thick lips feeding on shrimp, uh, then, then it's a case of introducing the, the flies uh, to the feeding fish and then start off with a slow strip about maybe 12 inches long and then increase the weight of the strip uh, to <coughs> induce a uh, juice tape from the fish and get their attention. So by the end, you'll be stripping the weight to get the fish to take. Uh, and then again, strips. Um, next slide, please. Thin lips. Um, thin lips uh, will also be found, found in estuaries. They're, again, they're the, the top mark to find them. <coughs> and um, they, they will also feed in currents in the same way that thicks do, but they tend to sit a little bit deeper in the water. <coughs> Excuse me. I did two talks at the weekend at the festival on the throat stomach. Um, thick lips will tend to sit in the water of six inches to a foot, a foot deep in an estuarine current, but fins can be down to about three feet in depth. Um, you, you locate the, the shoal because one or two members of that shoal will break the surface up above while the rest uh, remain deep. Uh, the, the same approach of drifting the fly stem. That works with one difference. Once the flies reach the fish, you then have to introduce that short, quick strip um, to retrieve the flies. <coughs> Excuse me, because um, fins won't respond to simply a, a drifting fly. It needs to be moving to, to get the reaction. <coughs> you can also find them uh, feeding over mud banks, sand banks, and very shallow water. They come in on the tide uh, and they're looking for mud shrimps. Uh, over, over muddy areas, uh, and they're trying to get to these shrimps before the shrimp return to their burrows. Once the shrimp are in their burrows, they're relatively safe from the mullet's um, attention. So the mullet know they have to intercept them before they escape, and that's why you'll see them enter very, very shallow water with their backs out, out and the same over sand, sand as well. Um, next slide. Uh, golden grace, uh, the fish in that photograph, that was the first mullet caught this season. Uh, on the 1st of May, and it was three pound, five ounces, so not um, a million miles away from the British record. <coughs> um, golden grays, they're really the beach bums of the, uh, the mullet family. Uh, so the, the aforementioned surf beaches in Cornwall, South Wales are good places to look for them. Um, and on the surf beaches, the, the approach for for the mullet is to to wait until low tide and you see them then advancing over the, the sand flats on the edge of the, the flooding tide in very shallow water. And you want to be traveling behind them. And that, that has a, a couple of main benefits. Firstly, you know, it can, be, it can be a pretty windy place to coast. So if you're coming behind the fish in the flood, you're going to have the wind behind your back, which makes casting uh, considerably easier. Um, and also the fish are looking away from you, so they're less likely to be spooked by uh, seeing you tail them. Um, and the, the approach is just to drop the flies ahead of them. A, a good setup in that uh, instance is a flex worm on the point and the mullet back on the dropper. Uh, and just keep casting ahead of the fish. Uh, and if there's any gentle waves rolling, just let the flies uh, roll about in the wash and just wait for the line to, to tighten them. That can provide some really interesting. Sport. 
Um, you will also find golden greys in estuaries along with the, the thicks and the thins. Um, and although you do find all three species in an estuary, they tend to be localised in, in where they, they feed. Um, as we said, mullets prefer, sorry, thick lips prefer the, the current. Uh, thin lips prefer mainly static water over mud uh, and sand. Uh, and the golden greys will be found almost exclusively over areas of sand. So if you have areas of sand and estuary that you fish, that's where you're likely to find a golden grey. Um, and the best approach for them is to, to look for them in, in a, areas of current around sandbanks, for, for instance, on the ebb. They'll tend to sit there just picking off food items. So you can drift the flies towards them as you would for them and then start that, that strip. Um, or on the ebb, they tend to sit in deeper water and then rush into the, the shallows on an area of sand or a sandbank to grab the sand shrimp. Uh, the sand shrimp, when they see them coming, they just drop into the sand and bury themselves, escape. So, so the, the golden greys have got to be in there really quick to, to get their prey. So the, the way to ambush them really is to, to kneel on a sandbank right at the water's edge so that your fly line is sitting in some water rather than on the sand to keep it clean. Uh, crouch down and uh, look for these fish. So they're, they're quite noticeable in clear water. And it's really very much like bone fishing in the, in the Caribbean. You'll see the fish coming in looking for shrimp, and you just drop the flies ahead on, on the sand, and as I approach them, start 12 to 18 inch, uh, fairly quick strip, and you should hopefully get, get, get a reaction. Uh, next slide. Um, yes, yeah, so the, the mullet nymphing technique, which I've just described, whether, whether it's the dead drifting or um, retrieving in static water, it, it could almost be viewed as a technique in its own right, I'd say, because um, when I fished for bass prior to taking up the mullet uh, challenge, um, I, I fished for bass, and I think the biggest bass I caught was about a pound and a half. As soon as I started fishing for mullet and drifting flies, then I started to get four, five, six pound fish. So uh, that, that was a bit of an eye opener. And at first, people would say, oh, that's, yeah, that's a decent byproduct, but it, it was so successful that, as I say, you know, I, th I think it's on the sort of technique and it's, it's on. Right, and the, the, the bass in the photograph there was a seven pound fish. That, that was tied on a mullet back, but I tied it on a heavy, strong hook deliberately to go looking for bass in an area of strong current. And I just drifted that from me, uh, and, and that fish had absolutely smashed it. Um, and I honestly couldn't miss the, the amount of species that have fallen to, to that particular method. And the little small mullet flies, you know, it's quite surprising to a lot of people that size. 12 shrimp patterns can account for such big fish. And I, th I think the, probably the strangest catch uh, had is, is shown on the next slide. It's, uh, a thornback ray, and that was to a weighted flexible. I, I mentioned that earlier when I went home to the vice and added lead and stuff to the body to get down deep to the mullet. And it, they were sitting in a trench as well. Uh, and that, that thing came out of the trench. I found it was, uh, that was quite a surprise. So that's, that's one of the great things I think about saltwater fly fishing is you can never quite be sure what uh, is going to take the fly next. Next slide. Playing a mullet. That's probably some a chapter I should have put in the book in, in hindsight um, because um, it's, it's the, the end part of the product. It's, it's obviously a very fraught, fraught time. And it really starts off with that strip strike that I mentioned. If you don't strip that strike to set the hook, if you simply lift the, the rod as you would if you're trout fishing, then <coughs> excuse me, the, the chances are high indeed that, that fish is going to throw the hook uh, within the first minute. So you, you've got to set the hook. Um, the mullet, especially large ones, will tend to spend the next few seconds just, just sitting there as if we make sure what's happened before uh, launching into hard, fast, long run. And it's a good thing for them to run, I think, because it tires them out. So uh, set, set the drag so they, they can run and, and use up some of that uh, energy. <coughs> and uh, they tend not to run for snags. They're not very snag minded, but um, they, they will on occasion head for something to see, such as boys or occasionally swans. So if you think that's happening, then you've got to apply concerted side pressure to steer the fish 
away from any possible snags, uh, because if they hit that snag, then it's game over. So don't be scared to place a lot of side pressure to stay that fish away. And that's the advantage of using um, fluorocarbon of, say, 10.4 pounds, as, as I do, although it's only 0.218 millimetres, which is quite thin. It's strong enough to be able to, to pull in that fish away. Uh, if, if you catch a thick lip in, in a current, then it's probably going to try and use that current to its advantage. When they're getting tired, <coughs> they can sit in the current and uh, rest, but you, you're still under a, a lot of tension on the rod because the current's coming into play. So it's good advice to remove the fish from the current as quick as you possibly can, get them into the shallows and start water and play them out in the, in the shallows. Now, when, when you do think he's uh, almost ready for the net and you've managed to lift his head just above the water for the first time, you're starting to breathe for the first time in 15 minutes, um, be prepared for quite a severe reaction. When mullets see the net, they, they, they know they're, they're in trouble and uh, you get a very strong reaction. They'll turn and they'll run out of the way again. Uh, some people try and hold the fish to prevent it from running and you'll often pull the hook or snap the leader. So be prepared for that strong reaction and just let the fish run again because it's probably only going to run um, five or ten yards at most. Uh, and it may take four or five attempts to, to actually get into the net um, because each time he sees a net, be prepared for the reaction. Because a lot of fish are lost, unfortunately, right in the net. Uh, next slide. Top 10 tips. Um, these may, may seem like small things individually, but they all add up to something grander. And I think any advantage you can get from fly fishing from the is certainly worth investing in. Uh, the, the mullet season. In the southwest of the country, you can almost fish for, for mullet all year round, and it's the same in Southern Ireland. Um, I know people that catch mullet in January and February. Um, on the south coast, they, they tend to appear sort of mid-April and become a viable target late April, early May, and they tend to hang around until third week in October, uh, when coincidentally heavy rains tend to fall. And that seems to cool down the estuaries particular and the mullet seem to move off in. So sometimes you'll, you'll find them in November still showing them but they're just not really feeding. I think the food, food chain has disappeared by then so they're just getting ready for, for migration for the winter. Uh, the further north you go where the water temperatures are cooler, um, the season's shorter, it might be June before they appear and they may move off in September so really the further south and west you go the, the longer the season. Books um, for the I'll tie my flies on Kamazan books, B100s and B170s. Um, and the reason for that is when I first started fishing for thick lips, which were present uh, in a current, I needed a, a, a good strong hook that was also quite light so that, that it could actually drift in that current. Um, I tried some thicker hooks to begin with and they just fell to the bottom. So they, they were too heavy to drift. So uh, that, that drifting factor is very important, uh, and that's uh, what I arrived at Camazan hooks after trying many, many different brands. Of the brand that I arrived at uh, swans. You'll often see swans, especially in estuaries, and sometimes many hundreds of swans. And a lot of anglers look upon them as a pest, but I've learned over the years that uh, often where you see swans feeding, you'll also find mullet. Um, and at first I used to think that was because swans and mullet feed on the same things. But now I, I think it's because uh, during their feeding activity, the swans are stirring up the bottom and they must be releasing a lot of food. Uh, and the mullet know that when they see the swans move into a certain position and start to feed, that food is going to become available so that the fish move in and eat them. So it's always worth prospecting swans if, if you see them. Competitive feeding, that was a very first slide mentioned because as I say without competitive feeding um, it's catching mullet flies quite a tough gig so you need to learn what competitive feeding looks like what feeding fish look like and um, as, as I've mentioned several times the location that you choose to fish whether you've been put onto that location by someone else or you've chanced upon it yourself 
uh, through research or using Google Earth, that's a good tool for looking at the coastline and choosing suitable locations to visit. Um, you may find, if you're unfortunate, that despite visiting that location regularly, all the stages of the tide, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, the fish simply don't feed, or there's so few fish there that competitive feeding is not going to take place. And if that's the case, then my advice would be to just forget that mark and move on to another one because it's, it's probably never going to become good, and they're, they're, they're just making life too difficult for some. Uh, tide tables, we spoke about those already. Um, quite a vital bit of kit. Fluorocarbon. I always use fluorocarbon. One of the main reasons for that is uh, I've tried nylon in the past because I had it in my trout bag and it was cheaper. Uh, and nylon monofilament is one of the very few things that I've witnessed uh, spooking shoals of mullet regularly, uh, especially if it's the first cast of the morning. The nylon's going to lie on top of the water and it coils. If it's sunny, it picks up the sunshine and it glints. And it just has this incredibly detrimental effect on mullet and they're long gone. It's quite incredible. Nothing else will spook them in the, in the same way in my experience. Fluorocarbon has the advantage of sinking more readily than monofilament. And uh, that's an advantage, especially in salt water because it's more buoyant than, than fresh water for a start. So you need to, to get the leader below the surface uh, to avoid spooking them. Long leaders for close up work. If uh, you're targeting Finwick mullet, golden grey mullet in very shallow water, they are coming towards you from the flood and tide. And again, when I say shallow water, I'm talking three inches, four inches often is the case. You have to crouch down and get, get on your knees, keep a low profile. Um, and as these fish come towards you, you don't want the fly line to land on them because that will um, most likely spook the shoal instantly. And if you spook a shoal in those sort of circumstances, it's, it's almost like a domino effect. You don't just spook the fish that are immediately in front of you. The, the, the panic just spreads along the whole sandbar. I've seen it 400 metres long. That's incredible. And those fish have gone. Uh, so what you really want is the fluorocarbon leader to land on the fish, especially if there may be a few fish even closer to you than you realise that you haven't seen. They're the ones that can uh, be put off by the fly line. But you just want the leader to land on these fish. So use a long leader, 14 feet, 16 feet. Um, you've probably only got a few feet fly line outside the rod tip that's that close. Uh, so get the you know, long leaders and that will really up your catch rate. The colour red, well, we've seen plenty of evidence in that in the, in the, the group of flies that I showed you. Uh, as I say, no doubt about it, colour red attracts mullet. So I would always have the colour red in any fly fishing from a mullet. Blend in, especially in shallow water if you're wading or if you're kneeling from for, for fish in shallow water. But by blending in, I mean if it's a, a sunny day, we'll tend to wear a blue top. Uh, so you've got the, the blue skies in the background. If I'm going in amongst swans for a session, then I'll put on a white top. I know what maybe sounds a bit petty, but it really works. You can get right up close to the swans and the fish will open. And, you, and again, that's the sort of thing that proves your catch rate. Um, and leader rigs, we, we already touched on them. They're, they're the pre-prepared leaders on a holder that allow you to change the, the leader when necessary. In a, in a very quick period of time. Um, next slide. And this this is the last one. Um, the telephone symbol. That that that's just a reminder uh, that the sea can be a dangerous place, uh, especially where mud's concerned. We do a lot of our, our mullet uh, fishing in areas of mud, soft sand, and people do become stuck. We, we just had the Orvis festival, sort of festival at the weekend in Halen Island, and uh, a few people got stuck. The, the mud was only probably two or three inches deep, but it was still enough that their, their feet got stuck and we had to come and take a shoulder each and lift them out. But some people do become properly stuck, and unfortunately, each year, uh, some you know, people do lose their lives. So you really must treat mud with caution. And in case you do fall into uh, any, any trouble, then it's good advice to have the harbour master and the coast guards 
uh, phone numbers on your contact list. Just in case, and the other slide just shows uh, it's, it's actually a, a ball that that guy's holding, not some unfortunate angler's head who's gone up to his neck. But it's just a reminder that you really must treat them up with uh, respect. That's, that's the last slide. Thank you very much. Questions will come later. Thanks very much uh, for that, Colin. Um, I think now we hand over to Hannah, if she's there. Um, there's been a number of questions that's come in through the uh, chat box. So, Hannah, do you want to lead on the uh, question and answer session? Yes, thanks, Stuart, and uh, thanks to the guys for a, a great presentation um, and for all of the, the questions in, in the chat box. Um, the first one comes from Mark, who asks, how can you tell fish are feeding? I fish a river and they cruise up and down just under the surface, but rarely feed. Do you want to answer that one, Paul? I think you're on mute, Paul. Can you hear me now? Excellent, yeah. OK, great. Feeding fish. Yes, like Colin said, you've got to find whether they're feeding or not, or you're going to spend a lot of time. Um, you've got to you've got to tell the difference between cruising fish and feeding fish and there's various ways on a float on a on a current they could well be taking things off the top and being very splashy that's very true of thick lips um if you're in skinny water it's it, and, and you've got good glasses on and you see the fish it, it's it's about observing them and and feeding fish will flash on the sides quite a lot that's a telltale sign and it's also a matter of how quickly they are moving around. If you can see them, you can see whether they're looking around for food or whether they're just cruising. Occasionally you can get them to feed by um, getting them to, or, or getting them to be competitive. If you've got a show and they're not really feeding, a quick rip between uh, with the fly can actually get them um, going, but very much those are the signs you're looking for. Active motion, not cruising. Great, thank you. Um, that's actually all the questions I can see in the chat box at the moment, um, but we've got some hands going up, so I will uh, hand over and give, give some privileges. Um, Pete Wilkins, you're first. I'm just going to allow your microphone and your camera. Um, if you'd like to unmute yourself, the floor is yours. Pete, I don't know if you're uh, trying to speak, um, but you just need to press the unmute button first so that we we can hear you. OK, um, we'll we'll come back to you, Pete, in a minute um, whilst you're figuring the technology out. Um, we've had some more questions come through in the chat in the in the meantime. Um, and Alan asks, what was the title of your book? And um, the audio faded out when, when you when you said so. All oh, right. Yeah, it's a month. And a half. <laughs> there it is. A little plug. Excellent plug. Yeah. <laughs> and where can people buy your book? Um, you can buy it from Cocky Bundy Books online uh, and at Amazon as well, I believe. But if, if you Google Colin McLeod uh, Mullet and Fly, then it takes you to, to a link. Excellent. Thank you. Sounds good. Um, Pete, I don't know if you want to try again. Uh, uh, it won't let you unmute. I don't have the ability to unmute you. I've already enabled your microphone and your your camera. Um, so you should be able to unmute yourself at the moment. Um, if not, in the interim, um, we will try and give someone else the opportunity whilst we're, we're just figuring out that that technology. Um, so Nick Moat, your uh, microphone is now enabled, so fingers crossed you have the, the opportunity to unmute yourself. Does that work for you, Nick? OK, 
Okay, it seems to be an issue with technology then. I don't know whether Nevin and Stuart could look at this in the background um, whilst we, we go through a few more questions. Um, we haven't come across this issue before, so I'm sure we can, can resolve it. Um, so just going back to some of the, the questions in the chat um, in the meantime, um, Eamon asks, can you suggest any good marks around the country where a beginner has a chance to pick up the ropes and have some success? Um, we don't get into specifics in locations, but what I can say, once you've found some mullet, stick with it. It's really, really important to get a spot that you can visit over and over again because they are quite reliable in their habits and you want to eliminate all the downtime. And you will find an hour or maybe two hours where the, where they turn on the feed on each t each part of the tide, whether that be flood or red, but it's really quite important. And it's I know it's difficult for those that are a long way away, but if you can find a mark and visit it and get to know it, that will really save you a long time, uh, a, a lot of time in the long run. But as Colin said, estuaries are, are top. Great, thank you. Um, so moving on to the next question, Peter asks, uh, what weight of lead would you recommend? I usually fly fast, fly fish sorry for for sea bass on a wf8 weight a, a, a fly like a, a six weight uh, is ideal um you can go right down to a four weight quite easily you could go up to an eight weight um if, if that's what you have but i would recommend a longer leader so uh, you're keeping the fly line back from the, the shoal uh, but a, a six weight is the, the, the sort of the, the balance Strong enough to tame large fish, but still with a degree of delicacy. Okay, great. Um, bear with me just one moment. Um, the next question is from John, who says, I'm a little surprised that none of your mullet flies contain orange components. I use several shrimp fly patterns with orange components for sea trout in Scottish estuaries. Have you tried orange for mullet? Um, no, because red, as I said, I tried some red, uh, orange tags, and yeah, yeah, they did work. To me, red is by far the most attractive color to my life. Uh, why that should be, I, I really don't know. But, um, it certainly works. I'd say try orange. <laughs> try it. Excellent. Yeah, you can only, uh, you can only try, can't you? Um, mm. So Nevin informs me that Andy has some questions that were sent in in advance. Um, so I'm just going to hand over to him to deal with those whilst we try and resolve the technology issues um, and allow the other qu questions to be answered. So over to you, Andy. Thanks a lot, Hannah. Yeah, we had a couple of questions come in in advance and um, one is a topic that we haven't um, touched on yet. And that's about uh, license requirements um, when you're fishing for mullets and especially with respect to catching a salmon species. And the question was mainly relating to uh, Wales and West England. And um, a number of years ago, I, I ran past this um, with um, Natural Resources Wales and the Environment Agency. And it's important to realise that you, you don't need the freshwater rod licence to fish for mullet or any species of sea fish. It covers, simply covers fish that are covered by the Salmon and Freshwater Fisheries Act. So as long as you've got the right to be fishing there and there's mullet there, then there's nothing to stop you. And the same goes for bass. And indeed, um, they both assured me, that's National Resources as well as and the Environment Agency, that um, unless they actually caught someone who was physically taking salmonids away, um, and, and they could quite easily demonstrate that they were fishing for mud or sea bass, then it would never ever result in a prosecution. So I think the message is, is you, you're perfectly allowed to do it. It's not up to you to prove to somebody else that you're mullet fishing. It's for them to prove otherwise. And certainly unless you have um, a salmon or a salmon or a sea trout in your bag, you're not allowed to have, there's absolutely no problem. And the, the other question is quite an interesting one and, uh, for Paul and Colin. 
that is a chap who's interested in fly fishing for mullet and in the Outer Hebrides. And um, I remember seeing last year on the, the White House in Walsham, go fishing in the Outer Hebrides fishing for sea trout as it happened. And they were looking at the mullet in the lagoon. And he'd like to ask how we should go about that. So if I could ask Paul and Colin how they would go about fishing for these obvious thick lip in the, in, uh, in the Outer Hebrides. Away you go. <laughs> you can have that one, Colin. <laughs> <laughs> so I should know the answer, but um, uh, yeah, I've, I've heard for a number of years now reports of large numbers of mullet in the Outer Hebrides, Inner Hebrides, so this may be a venue for the future, certainly, but I've not heard of any being caught. Um, but I, I would think that the, the same uh, techniques would work if, if you can find these mullet feeding around where the river runs in the sea uh, then you can try the drifting technique to them there uh, because that, that's the best the, the best method or to send produce uh, shrimp patterns such as the Romy sand shrimp or the spectra shrimp the spectra shrimp is one of only two patterns i've experienced that thick lips will actually chase uh, it's not because they're lazy fish that they don't chase it's just because they sit in the current range. But the, the old Victorian fly, the red tag, and the spectrum, they're the two two patterns that thick lips will noticeably chase and really chase hard. So you, you could put those in a month and then start a fairly quick retrieve and see what happens. But, but I guess they'll be feeding on shrimp, these uh, these thick lips. So if you can find out what sort of shrimp are in the area uh, and try and mimic them, tie a fly to represent them, or, to, or just try the... The, the Romes and a spectra, as, as we do. They're good searching flies, the Romes and the spectra. And, and waters that you're not familiar with, they put them on and they tend to work wherever you are. So that, that, would, that would be my advice, but uh, please let us know how you get on. Okay, great. Um, have you anything to add, Paul? Um, no, not on that one. Okay, cool. Um, right. Uh, chap's got a house in Milford on Sea in Hampshire. And he also has a club or guides that can start him on the fly, and he's a reasonable fly angler. Um, I would say the obvious club to join is the NMC, and we'll help point him in the right direction. And then, as for guides, if I can hand you again over to Colin. Um, there, I don't really know of any guides um, who offer their services. Guided in the past for a number of years until 2014 when the mullet population at the Arpaid locations. I suspect the fish migrated in the winter uh, after being there since the 1960s uh, and they never came back the following spring. So I think it's safe to assume that the commercial nets had decimated the bass stocks that decided to turn to mullet. And that's particular uh, population of mullet along with several Sussex and several Northern Ireland and uh, Welsh populations as well. So at that point I thought no I can't guide anymore because one I have to go and find new locations now where I can fish from a mullet and I, I realise then just the amount of pressure that they were, they were under. So yeah. that, that oh. um, so there's lots of best guides around and yeah, there's also a lot of information out there now um, on the Mullet on the Fly forum on Facebook, but also on YouTube. There's uh, an awful lot to be picking up there. And a lot of times it's just going out there and looking for, and, and, and trying it out. Yeah. Because yeah. it's a guide in itself. And as Paul says, Mullet on the Fly uh, Facebook group, 9,000 members, lots and lots of information. And of course, the book. Uh, there, there is the only time I guide now, along along with Paul, is at the Orvis uh, Saltwater Fly Fishing Festival, which takes place in September in Hayland, England. Uh, so th there are workshops and guided sessions there. So that that's, that's that's worth considering. And they do have a beginners weekend as well in June, where complete beginners can. Uh, 
have a have a weekend being cooked for saltwater species, not just in the class as well. Of course, as a club, we recently held the master class as well at Hailing Island, didn't we? Yeah. And that's a completely free to enter event. And it's the same for, I mean, I'm mostly bait fish. You have to learn the techniques, I think, and it's about learning the techniques and where to find them. And Colin's especially has gone into great detail of that tonight. And then going out and finding a few and then applying those techniques yourself. So I would suggest the August Festival and next year we'll be running another Mullet Masterclass, which just can reassure you that you're doing the right thing. And then it's just a matter of finding them and following the advice of these guys and um, hope success will follow. Yeah, I find these uh, Facebook groups, um, if you go on them and say, look, I'm in, in this area, keen to get started, you'll always get somebody who'll say, look, I live near from like, yeah. my so They're always ready to go. If I'm honest, for me, the, the period of time I was having to hire and explore marks, that was the most rewarding time of my mullet fishing. You know? So it's a shame to lose out now, really, because you, you really get the satisfaction from doing a lot of it yourself. Can I um, pop in now or not? I've got one more question. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, welcome, welcome to Jim. Jim. Um, uh, the, the, the last question. And um, there's a crafty which is on the fresh side of a, a lock um, in a harbour where he catches a lot of mullet on the MEP spinner and asks for ragworm, which are obviously thin lips and it's a recognised technique. And he says he's unable to catch them on flies. And he's tried most of the Collins flies, but to no avail. So I was from what we've heard, it's not the flies, it's how you're fishing them. So what do you he, reckon? Yeah, it's depth of water as well. He might be trying, uh, if he's spinning, you obviously got to have a depth of water. So it may well be too deep for the fly. Um, look in the margins. They will follow a fly and they'll also take a, get a lot of mullet on the lift off, just like you do with trout. So it's important to see see if they're following your uh, flyers as, as uh, but I would suspect he's trying it too deep, but that's just an assumption of mine. But try a bit shallower and try the, the try the margins. Thanks, good advice, Colin. Uh, yeah, exactly what what Paul said. I would say it's a water depth, and um, you know what one of the golden rules of fly fishing for moment is you should be in water three to twelve inches deep. If you're standing in water knee deep, then you're probably getting too deep. And if you're on the freshwater side of a lock, the chances are you've got <laughs> more than a foot. <laughs> yeah, I've caught thick in fresh water, and they're, they're looking for shrimp, the same as anywhere, anywhere else. But... Okay, great. So if I can hand you back to um, Pete, who's um, online now, and Hannah, thanks very much. Okay. Evening, everybody. Um, Hannah, you asked a question about finding mullet, and you were you were seeing cruising mullet, but none feeding. Um, what I would suggest is to usually they're doing that when they're waiting to go to a feeding spot, and they go to a feeding spot every day. They, they follow the same routine. What I would suggest is looking for low water marks with mud and finding mullet scrapings. And once you find where the mullet scrapings are, you will find then the mullet when they come in. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Pete. Um, I, I, it was that, was that what you wanted to, to say or did you yeah, have a question just as well? I wanted to say, to carry on when you were speaking earlier that, you know, they're probably just holding there waiting to get to the spot they want to feed in and um, they do the same every day but if you went a little bit further up or below that you'll probably find that they find the bay where the scrapings are in and you'll find that's the spot where they're going to be feeding excellent well th thanks for your contribution pete um we're uh sorry i can hear a lot of feedback at the moment but we're we're, we're just coming up for half past eight would you both be okay to hang on for just 10 more minutes just to go through some more questions would that be okay yeah. no worries okay great um 
So we're just going to return to the chat box quickly and I'll, I'll try and alternate between chat box questions and, and those with your hands up and, and see how we go. Um, if if we don't get to all of the questions, I will pass them on to our speakers this evening. Um, it, hopefully they, they will be able to, to answer those, but I'm, I'm volunteering them for that at the moment. So uh, <laughs> feel free to, 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 to say otherwise, guys. Um, but just just going back to, to, to the chat box now. Um, Francis asks, there has been discussion on mullet on the fly about using static flies resting on the bottom in muddy estuaries. Does anyone have any experience of this? I don't, but I've got a friend that does. And um, yeah, I I think what they're doing is putting a worm on static with an indicator. I don't have any experience of that, but I have a couple of friends that are starting to pick up mullet consistently so it's something I might have a go at but not on that particular one for me Colin um yeah I think it's probably in water where the clarity is poor so I mean we, we the typical nutrition Francis Paul and myself do and a lot of people in the south coast um it's, it's in clear water so it's very much sight fishing but if you are fishing for water clarity is poor. Um, this is a technique that they've come up with there and it's, it seems to work, which is good. Um, and it's just a case of leaving that worm fly on the bottom, waiting for a fish to find it in the very poor water clarity and pick the fly up. Uh, and I, I think initially they were missing a lot of the takes or they were too slow to strike. So that's why they start to use an indicator. So they, they just watch the indicator, which is a bit like float fishing. And then when you see the indicator move, then they would strike and uh, that increased the uh, success rate. So, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a new technique. It's, it's similar to what I described in my PowerPoint presentation about following the golden greys in over the sand. Um, there's one area in Hampshire I fish where the water clarity is very poor, but it's the same situation. And with the worm, I would cast that ahead of where I assumed the fish to be and just leave it there or give it a very, very slow move. Every, every so often just hang on to the line and eventually one would take, take the fly and go. So it's, they're just using an indicator to make it uh, that little bit easier to see when a fish has shown interest in the fly. So yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a new technique and it seems to be working, so it's one to watch. Are these guys, Colin, are they catching um, predominantly thins or thick lips? Thick, thin, yeah. Thin lips in the Thames. And the, yeah. the videos they've posted, the, what, you know, the clarity is like, zero so they've done extremely well to pick up fish in those circumstances it's probably the only way to catch fish um, yeah have a lot of thin lips in um the seven near me uh, which which is extremely colored so it'd be an interesting technique to try there i would guess it would work equally well mm -hmm. thank you um so moving on to the next question sorry because i'm just conscious of, of time um bill asks does weather make any difference or colin's pictures seem to be on a dry sunny day <laughs> it's because i'm sunshine but um no it makes no difference in my experience i've caught mullet in the pitch dark i've caught them on 32 degrees of heat pouring rain howling winds uh, what, what really affects them is the, the tide and the time that they they feed during that tide so that they're food orientated they're not really, really bothered about the weather okay great thank you um alan asks doesn't the rod license requirement kick in a certain distance from the sea um no it doesn't no the, it actually extends all the way out to the six mile limit for species detailed under the salmon and freshwater fisheries act so that salmon sea trout any coarse fish and also smell from the European eel. Uh, but it's specific to the species. It's nothing to do with freshwater or seawater. Great. Thank, thanks, Andy. Um, Simon asks, what knots do you favour for forming leader hoop, hoop uh, sorry, leader loops and for fly attachment? Say that one again. What knots do you favour for forming leader loops and for fly attachment? Um, perfection loop for me on uh, on on the loop on the leader, and uh, I tie my shrimp flies direct with a just a um, a grinner knot basically, 
I don't tuck it because it's just easy for me to undo it, but that, that's what I do. Well, I'll, I'll just go for a surgeon's loop for the loop-to-loop -loop connection hmm. and a half tuck blood knot for connecting fly, simply because my granddad taught me that when I was about eight years old and uh, I've never forgotten it and it's never let me down. Great, thank you. Um, John asks, have you tried larger than size 12 hooks for your mullet flies? Personally, no. Um, tw uh, 12 is the largest. I've gone down to 14. Yeah. That, that just seems the right size for the type of shrimps trying to imitate with our pattern. So what do you think? You probably can go bigger, but what we do works. So uh, I'm a bit afraid to go bigger, to be honest. But, um... No, 12 and 14 for me. Great, thank you. Um, so so we're just going to make the switch from um, uh, chat box questions to, to those with their hands up. So Nevin's given presenter privileges to, to those with their hands up at the moment. So Clive uh, Paveley, if you'd like to unmute yourself, um, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks, guys, but you, you, you've covered what I was going to ask. So, so press on to the next one. Great, thank you. Um, definitely a comprehensive overview tonight, I think. Um, I've got a guy, uh, excuse me, I'm sorry, I don't have your name, but I have your almost code name, I guess. Um, Badger, would you like to unmute yourself? Badger. Yeah, I didn't think I'd get away with that one, but... Yeah, we, knew, you know. we know who it is. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So, um, last weekend, some, one of the places I was fishing, there was a plateau with deep water either side of it. And there was a sort of like a almost like a vapor trail of mullet leading away into the into the current and they would occasionally come onto the onto the plateau but you would see fish flashing out in the current in the deeper water and i was ignoring them because close by there were fish out of the current that were definitely not feeding or they were just sitting around and going around in circles very slowly the ones that were over the deep water they would be between six inches and a foot down and they would occasionally flash. Do you think they could be feeding the things that are washed off of the plateau? And you could target them with a Ghostbuster and, and a Spectre or something on the dropper? Yeah, de definitely. Um, if, if you think uh, the, the currents I, I fish tend to be you know, foot deep, sometimes are maybe two feet deep. That's a little bit deeper than normal. In fact, you, you know the, the place I'm probably talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That in itself was a little bit deeper than normal. But my suspicion is it doesn't matter if it's a foot deep, five feet deep, or in the, in the case of the place you're talking about, it could even be 10 feet deep. Or more. The fact is, yeah, yeah. it's in the top foot. So the, the current, no matter how deep it is, it's still carrying food. And if you're seeing those fish flashing, that's a sign, that's an indication of feeding. But yeah. they're still in the top foot. So you want your flies to be in the top foot. Yeah, that was a difficult scenario, that one, Dave. I know I saw those fish, and um, yeah. it was a, quite a fast current, so you'd have to get down, maybe the grayling on an indicator type, heavier fly, but you have to play around with that one, don't you? I would say a weighted, yeah. you know, heavy flexi worm, maybe with a buoyant worm above it, acting as, a, as an indicator as well, just drift the, wind, the worm pattern through them. So, yeah. yeah. My hands are sitting here. My hands are sitting here on my vice, and I've been listening to you talk tying different weights of different different types of hooks to try and get to different types of weights. So we'll have another go. Exper experimentation that's key. And by the way, Colin, that permit over your right shoulder, it's the wrong way up. <laughs> oh. uh, no, it's, a, it's a box or something. It's a yeah. Oh yeah, that's a box. Yeah. It's been annoying me for about an hour, but anyway, neither, neither in or there. Thanks, thanks, chaps. Thank you. Excellent. Um, well, we've got about two more minutes left, um, so I'm just going to whiz through the chat box and ask any remaining questions. If you hear any background noise, I apologise. It's my uh, German Shepherd puppy making a lot of noise. Um, so uh, Mark Singleton asks, I have a, a gifted FW7WT rod. Any advice on a saltwater reel setup to get me going? I am a river fly angler. Oh, you've got more tackle than I have. 
Yeah, uh, depends on how much you want to do. You can go, you can go real simple and real cheap by getting a, an airflow um, carbon reel, um, which are really I can't remember the name of them, but you can go really cheap with a reel that's going to hold up to the salt. You could buy, you can use your trout reel, but you got to wash it really, really well. Anything that will hold with the decent drag is quite important. Anything that holds a six weight with plenty of um, backing will will be fine. Um, I happen to like Danielson, um, but everybody has their own uh, favorite. All of us do great reels. You can, it depends on how 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 often you're going to do it. You can either spend a lot of money or not. But uh, most important thing, you're in salt water. You got to take care of it, and it has to have a good drag. Great, thank you. And and one final one before we we hand over to Stuart. Um, a bit of a. a, a theory session I suppose to, to end. Uh, Minvis says from my very few encounters with mullet they're not very spooky fish. They don't seem to mind anglers even a few feet away and if they are coming to estuaries and shallow bays to not to feed or feed very in little short periods um, any theories what their main purpose to visiting the marks where we can try and catch them is? Mm, they'll be coming in for food at some point and don't be too sure that you haven't spooked them. Sometimes they'll see you and not spook, but they'll ignore you all day long. So um, it's always best to try and sneak up on them. I see a lot of um, anglers go in wading before they've cast the water they're stepping into, spooking all sorts of shoals. Sometimes they'll spook for a long time. Sometimes they'll just reset, especially in high traffic areas when there's boats and birds and paddle boards and all the rest of it. They get used to it. But um, it's just observation. You still may have spooked those fish, but they're just going to choose to ignore you rather than run away. Colin might want to add to that one. Mm. If I understood the, the question correctly. Um, as Pete Wilkins said, Wilkins said earlier, often it's just traveling. If they come into an estuary and they're, not, they're just traveling, set speed, set direction, um, all, in the, all, all in like a pack. Um, then they're just travelling somewhere, you know, that they're that they're on their way to a particular place, and hopefully they're on their way to feed somewhere. So you, you really want to be tailing those fish if you can, just follow them up the estuary to see where they go, uh, because that's that's why they would normally enter an estuary is, is to feed. So if you get to a particular point where you uh, intercept them, then be prepared to follow them further up the estuary because that's where they may well start to feed. Great, thank you, thank you. Well, I'm I'm going to hand uh, back over to Stuart. Thank you, everyone, for your questions this evening. Uh, we will collate those, and any that, any that we haven't answered, we'll hand over to the National Mullet Club uh, to respond to in their own time, if, if if they have time. But but thank you very much for for a wonderful presentation and for this evening. Thank you, Hannah, and um, particularly thank you to Colin, Paul, and Andy for an absolutely fascinating evening. I've learned a huge amount. Um, and I can't wait to get back with uh, one of you guys or somebody else and, and give it another go um, and try and improve my skills a bit. Um, just before I sort of close the session as well, Bill uh, was asking, he obviously lives near Hailing Island or over at Langston or somewhere like that because he says he can see the Orvis Festival from his window and he wants to know how often it takes place. I think it's annual, isn't it? It's once yeah. a year in that first week of September. Um, so, Bill, you'll have to wait till next year now, but but do go along. It's a fantastic event. Um, so thanks very much for the evening. I thought it was a great evening. Thanks for all the questions as well. It was a really good and interesting discussion. Um, as we usually do at this stage, as, as well as thanking our presenters, um, I'm really turning to you as our audience. Uh, we do these uh, forums regularly. We're always keen to hear from you, to hear what you'd like us to to cover and what you'd like us to uh, get presenters in and to talk about on these evenings. So do let us know. Uh, there's two ways you can do that. You can either drop us an email um, or Nevin will be sending around a sort of survey questionnaire in follow up to this to see how your experience was, how we can improve it. And as I said, what topics you'd like to discuss um, in the future. So that should come out in the next week or so. Um, We've also, as I've said, recorded this at the beginning, so we will be posting this on our website. So if there's anything you missed, um, I shall certainly be going back and looking at the flies uh, and looking at some of the technique 
uh, set things again to see what I can learn. But if there's anything else you've missed, um, you know, do please go and view this uh, on our website. It'll be on the C pages of the Angling Trust website. And before I close the evening, I'd just like to say that this is actually Nevin's last virtual sea angling forum with us. Uh, Nevin will be standing down as our moving coordinator soon. Uh, he will be sorely missed. Yes. Um, we have enjoyed and, and really valued the work that Nevin has done. Uh, we will be replacing Nevin. I will wish, reassure you of that. We uh, It's one of my priorities to do that. Um, but but I'd just like to publicly really pay tribute to Nevin and thank Nevin very much for all the hard work he's done, not only in these sea angling forums, but for other sea angling um, sort of activities within the Angling Trust for creating our volunteer network and really building that up. Uh, he's he's developed a fantastic foundation for us, um, and I'm looking forward uh, as head of campaigns to build on that as soon as we can get a replacement in post. Um, and I will reassure you that these virtual forums will continue. Um, we will be or continuing to organise them. Um, I will be taking on that role um, until we found a replacement for Nevin. So, um, so thank you, Nevin. And finally, thank everybody for a really fascinating evening uh, and for you all sticking with it and for your questions uh, and your interest. I think, you know, uh, saltwater fly fishing is an absolute growing sport. Um, and a really exciting one. So thanks very much. And, and I think with that, I'll say good night and enjoy your evening, everybody. Thanks, thanks very much, guys. See you.